Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back talking about saltwater bait casters that sounded weird even coming off the tongue so so smooth on the water (laughs) so mark and i i guess this was two weeks ago did a podcast slash video like this just talking about all the new spinning reels coming out for 2021 and at the very end we asked for feedback what do you guys want and we had an overwhelming amount of people saying let's talk about bait casters and then Luke, we went fishing here recently, and Luke whips out a bait caster. I was like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I, finally, and, I finally found a place for him, Joe. <laughs> finally found it. And so then to kind of bring all this in, you wonder who the fourth person is here. You might have heard a fourth voice laughing in the background. So we have an insider member, Bill DeWeese. He's just a normal dude who loves fishing, and he's, I would call him scientific about it, where he loves just testing out all kinds of stuff and then reporting on what he likes, doesn't like. And I love all the feedback he's given, both pros and cons. And he's one of the guys that uses both, which is kind of rare. I feel like a lot of times it's just, hey, I, I'm from Texas and I only want to use bait casters and spinning socks uh, or the other way around. And so Bill's going to add a lot of value on this podcast to talk about um, really just kind of the pros and cons. So Bill, kick it off. Why, why is it that this is such like uh, an issue with people? I, I feel like there's a lot of trash talking with bait well, casters. I, I think there great. is, right? I mean, I think that's part of it is like, obviously, when you look at bait casters in Texas versus Florida, but there's also, uh, it, you know, from an inshore perspective, is there's a lot of similarities to, as we talked a little bit briefly earlier about bass fishing and bass fishermen. And I know people that you, you see them on the deck of their boat and they've got like six rods on either side of them and they're standing in this little corridor in the middle and they're all bait casters. And uh, they, they, there's a versatility to that. Uh, but but there's also like this this sort of competition between how we do things in inshore. And I grew up on a river, so I've kind of done both, right? So my, I spent my life on the Wispeachy River growing up until the late 80s when I moved into Pinellas County. So then I kind of like just became a bass fisherman in salt water, which was, you know, just carrying it forward, which is kind of unproductive in a lot of ways if you try to do that. And Salt Strong changed a lot of that for me. But um, you end up looking at it from a perspective of, uh, of two different people doing something very similar, but two different worlds that they live in, you know, so this fact I'll start right away. <laughs> so, and, and I do want to make a comment about the six rods on both sides. That's when you really <laughs> have it figured out, Bill. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have 12 on both sides of me. All right. So <laughs> when I have six, that means I'm hammering fish. All right. Well, you, you know, and I, I have a Maverick, so it's a little bit of a small boat. It's, it's not the smaller one, but it's like a really small bay boat. And so when I have two to three people on, I'm, I'm, I'm down to two rods just to be courteous. Sometimes I'll bring a third rod and I'll keep it tucked under the gunnel. If I'm by myself, every rod holder in the center and some under the gunnel, <laughs> you know, I don't like to leave them on the deck, but I definitely want one for each occasion. <laughs> So yeah. t- let's start off by talking about when when do you use because there's a lot of people listening who are just like dumbfounded and they're like, why would you ever use a bait caster? When do you use it? When 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 do you grab that when you're on your Maverick and you're loaded up by yourself? Yeah, when, when do you, you have, go into the bait caster? Yeah, when you have well, eight uh, rods uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so I started out like most people will start out with bait casters. It's like you want a very dense plug. So that's logically going to map to something like a topwater, right? So I started out throwing topwater because it's easy to get into bait casting with a uniformly dense plug. I mean, you take something like a Zara Spook or a Top Dog uh, or any of the ones like it, Skitter Walk, they're going to go really punch to the wind, right? So they're going to make the casting process easier. And then I started out taking that, then it's like, okay, well, I love this reel. I love this action. I mean, it's like, I used to joke, I want to cast with a spin fish and I want to catch the fish with a bait caster because that experience is really cool. But then you get into some of the nuanced aspects of the control you have, right? So I liken it this way, like, you know, if you're in a platoon or a squad or whatever, right? And you got an emission, you got a sniper. He's got this sniper rifle that's longer 
It's got different characteristics. And then if you're going to go house to house, you want a carbine. You want something really tight that can get through doorways and whatever. To me, the bait caster is the carbine. It's that rifle or that reel, that rod, that combo that can get into really tight locations. I'll give you an example. I mean, in back in the spring, Jimmy Tensel and I were fishing down in 10,000 Islands. And we go from the outside where we're catching snook. We go to the bays. All of a sudden, we're in creeks. And I'm, you know, you're, you're, you're pitching, you know, so you can really move from a distance cast down to a really short cast down to a pinch, right? And you can do that. You see people doing that kind of like with a uh, spinning reel, but uh, it's more really effective when the actual thumb that's using to manage the clicker or the, the you know, the, the, the spool release is right there at the spool. I mean, it's a one hand operation. It's so. I mean, I, I'll give you another analogy. I like it this way. Like, I mean, I'm not a big golfer, but I did a little bit of golf uh, training and such. You know, like you have a bag. That bag has some clubs. You've got a wood. You've got irons. You've got wedges. You've got a putter. And you can go out and spend 500 bucks on a ping wood. And you love that thing, but you wouldn't use it to putt with, right? So you, there's a diversity of tools. And you're talking about six to 12 rods on your boat. I mean, I'll have top water. And then I'll have, and like I said, I've gone down to the point now by changing out and understanding better characteristics of it, I can now do Ned rigs, you know, on a 200 bait caster and they soar, right? Which I would have not been able to do starting out, right? I was on the beach and I'm using a big plug or I'm using a big spoon and I'm chasing Spanish Mac on vacation on the beach or something. So you could, you could just sail it. But now you can get down to some finesse stuff and get finesse and distance. Right. So it's, it's really kind of like you wouldn't want to go onto a golf course and just walk around with a wood and say, all right, I'm going to win this game. Right. It's going to put you at a significant disadvantage. So you can do just about anything with a spinning reel. You can do just about anything with a bait caster. But when you start to look at it as a spectrum of capabilities, it's kind of cool. You know, do you, so that's do you how load, I kind of got into it and kind of expanded it. Do you load yours up with, you know, these 50, 80 pound braid like the bass guy? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, no, no, no. I actually run 20 pound braids. Okay. So, and actually I seek out some of the subtle characteristics of braids, right? Like I don't, I love Power Pro. It's one of my favorite brands. It's on almost all my rods. I don't like Power Pro and 20 pound on a bait caster. You know, there's other braids that are more round and even like some braids are a little bit more of a ribbon. So you talk about that perennial problem of the line digging into the school. There's ways to manage that, but there's also uh, subtle characteristics of different lines that help you in that process of either not digging in or making it dig in cause less friction when you cast subsequently you know so yeah so what what line have you found is best about not digging i've, I've been using power pro and uh, i have had i haven't had any significant issues but uh, after like hooking a big snook or if you'd break off like it definitely does dig in or are you finding yeah it, does, yeah, it does it, it, yeah I, well, I went actually, I was, I've always kind of experimenting around, right? And again, I kind of felt like I'm comfortable with Power Pro. I like it. I went to Spider Wire and Visibrate. That I put on spinning reels and I saw, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. I saw no competitive advantage to Spider Wire and Visibrate on a spinning reel. Really none whatsoever. Um, but I did see that you got like this Teflon coating. It's a little bit more slicker. And that worked out in 20 pound, allowed me to go down to 20 pound on a spinning, on the bait caster. And, and that's kind of like, you know, this white stuff here. This is the, uh, the Invisibrate. And you got to watch spider wire drives me nuts sometimes because they've got 85,000 different sub brands, right? Where Power Pro, you walk in, you pick your color, you pick your weight, you go to the register. You got to be a little bit more cautious with this, but the, the Invisibrate works nicely from a slickness perspective. Uh, recently I went to the, uh, the, um, suffix suffix is known for having a uniformly round characteristic. Now, Bill, well that is a pretty, if you guys are listening, that is the prettiest looking reel I've ever seen. Oh, this is well, awesome. that was just, that I'll, was, I'll, I'll tell you about this. <laughs> this is, that was tape. This I thought that was your line color. I was like, oh no, my no, gosh, no, they're no, making no. it in rainbow camo <laughs> no, 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 now. Just, what in the world? Just, no, no, no. This is coastal camo. This is kind of a blue and white. Uh, <laughs> whoo, yeah, so this is a whoo. round that has a Gore-Tex. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have some of that depth on on my offshore reels. It, it's kind of a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Fruit stripe gum. <laughs> Mark, Mark, what do you think about all this? Because you, you, we did a bait caster versus spinning. I guess it was a whole tackle Tuesday and we were all teaming up on you. So now you're like, you're kind of comfortable. What, what are your thoughts on all this stuff? Hey, and that's why I'm sitting back with my hands above my head, just enjoying the conversation. 
Oh, you sit on the Mountain Dew. And Mark's all hopped up on Mountain Dew, so he's going to come after us here. <laughs> he is. He's trouble. got Mountain Dew. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, to me, you know, uh, of course, I, I grew up in the Texas and Louisiana market for, for most of my childhood. And, and it's it was always bait casters. And it was predominantly because we also lived in the best fishery when it came to freshwater fishing as well. Mm-hmm. You know, Texas is is, is known for it. You know, and if, you know, the simplicity of what Salt Strong teaches is how to use one product in multiple venues and multiple applications. And that was the bait casting market back home. You know, you could use the bait casters in salt water and fresh water and perform extremely well. You know, I think the biggest thing for me that I found over the years, um, you know, and, and I know the weight of the spinning and the weight of bait casting is is getting very similar in today's standard, but it just seemed like I had less fatigue on the water fishing all day, throwing a thousand times a day. You know, the way that I can hold the product close to me, close to my chest and and really cut down on arm fatigue over the day. um, You know, that that was one of the real big reasons why I loved bait casting. Or, or is it because you can't cast as far with it? <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's also being able to change out, right? Like you can go from a spinning reel and let's say you're in a grind, right? You're doing a lot of yeah. casting all day trying to get that trophy trout or you're trying to get a, 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 bo- a box of trout, whatever, or you're trying to get that redfish. You can switch, right? So you can do a spinning reel and all of a sudden you realize your wrist is a little bit more fatigued and you can switch out. So there's a weight issue that, that, that can be seen easily, but there's also a strategy and style issue that just, like I do, the, I, I I hike a lot, and sometimes when you're halfway through an eight mile hike, you got to like change your muscles, right? You got to you got to walk a little differently and use a different set of muscles. And I think there's some aspect of that with bait casting that gives you some a break when you're really having to grind it out. Yeah, and my style of fishing, you know, I I'm not the guy that's going to sit in the middle of an open flat where I have a hundred yards all the way around me. I, I like yeah. to get close to structure. I, I'm I'm a short distance. I pitch, I flip, you know, I'll skip things underneath yeah. things. You know, that's just my style of fishing. I'm I'm a very aggressive and very fast moving style of fisherman. Um, yeah. you know, as far as wide open, you know, chunk and winding, you know, yeah, I, I mean I can do it well. And, and on the freshwater side, I do a lot of it on offshore fishing, on muscle bars and 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 stuff like that. But you know, to me, it was more of a, I can, I can just really keep everything in close to me and mm-hmm. really just fine tune and, and do everything with little effort compared to a different setup on a, on a spinning. And, and, you know, in today's market and, and, you know, again, I don't want to get into the weeds, but, you know, the, the bait casting market has evolved faster um, and, and more competitive than the spinning market has. It just seems like the spinning market is is still trying to catch up to the, the te- technology of what's in bait casting reels. And to me, the bait casting was kind of like the coming out party and then the spinning market would come up to standard. And now there's such a parallel platform between the two um, with you know the engineering behind the reels that, um, you know, there, there's a market for both. And I just, I still prefer to use bait casting just because I feel that I have better control of my lure yeah. and based yeah. on how I fish. Yeah, no, I agree. Especially again, we fish in variable locations where you have these tiny creeks where you're going through some pat- the narrow passages. Uh, you can take advantage of that. Sure. And still do well on the flats, right? I mean, you take an MR set 27 mirror lure or a top dog, you know, you're, you're really not distance challenged with a bait caster. <laughs> you know, yeah, the, there are scenarios to where I believe that a spinning combo can outperform. Sure. A, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. 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 Especially when it's really light application lures, you know, like a 17 MR. Um, I, I think that the spinning is by far, you know, the best application for that because it throws it well. And especially if you're using braid, you need a little weight to your product to make sure, sure that that spool doesn't overrun. Right, um, exactly. Uh, you know, yes, a spinning rod and reel will always outcast a bait casting rod and reel because there's no magnets when it comes to the performance of a long distance cast. But um, 
the control of that cast on a bait casting outfit, in my opinion, is a little bit better. Um, the bait casting on the heavy end, I think even if you match the rod performance to the lure weight, I just think bait casting applications handle heavier products better than a spinning rod and reel application will handle heavier products. Right. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's. And I think you, he does bring up a good point too in talking about the rod characteristic, right? And that could be kind of a podcast of its own, right? But, uh, you know, I, you got to go with five characteristics, right? You got the length, you got the power, you got the speed, you got the line weight, you got the lure weight. And the lure weight is something like I ignored for ages because in spinning, you really don't like, you don't, you don't care as much about it unless you get into some really uh, high performance kind of casting. Then all of a sudden it becomes important. But for your garden variety angler, it doesn't really matter as much unless you're trying to sling some big heavy weight at the beach, you know, and you're trying to do it with a 3000 series rod and it's bent over as you're holding it, you know, you got a problem, right? But for the most part, when you get into now matching that lure to that lure weight, that was a key thing for me. And even going down the line to where you're getting an extraordinarily effective cast out of a, you know, a Ned rig with a total terminal weight of a half ounce, right? Then all of a sudden you start looking at that weight range and get in that sweet spot and it makes every bit of difference. So, yeah. Let's talk about brands because I, I think just going back when I got my first uh, bait cat saltwater bait casting reel, I didn't really know where to start. And we were actually fishing with C.A. Richardson. We're doing some filming and, you know, he uses a lot of bait casters and uh, he's like, just go with Daiwa. And I did. I got the yeah. uh, code. This is still have the old box, the coastal yeah. uh, TWS 200 HS for you, you guys oh. listening. What, what do you guys what's a good brand or what? Like, where do you even start if you're a, a spinning guy or gal and you're like, all right, I want to give this a shot. But there's so many different options out there. I, I'll take that real if you're no longer. Even. No, I use it. It's <laughs> <laughs> No, I just mess it with you. Yeah, no, um, I, I would say this. I mean, I think it's like anything else, right? You You don't want to go too cheap and get into quality issues. But or or like a, a you know designed in Cupertino made somewhere else right you don't want a great design that's implemented poorly if they don't have good quality control you're going to end up with a a product that's going to frustrate you or not provide you what you need to overcome the challenges or the 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 the, the, mecha the mechanisms that are different for bait casting right so for me I think there are some fantastic reels in the one hundred dollar to one hundred fifty dollar price range. So there's really like the Shimano SLX. I don't do Shimano. I had a Shimano. I love Shimano. I actually got into Lose. So two of mine are Lose. And then uh, I actually, that reel you had in your hand, I got the chance to play with one at Sodium up in uh, Crystal River. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be my next reel. And I needed to bring another reel online. And I wanted a baitcaster. And I said, okay, I want this one or I want a Lose tournament. Because you're now looking at a $250 reel, right? And um I went from this one, which is the Lose Speed Spool LFS Inshore. This is my first and oldest. This is a fantastic reel. It's like a $130 reel, but it has some of the basic, it's, it's an inshore. So I think that really means that it's got a little bit more drag. I think this one, the early ones were 14 pound drag, which is more than sufficient, but a little bit more than the classical 10 pound drag ranges that you've got. And uh, it has a little bit better drainage and a few other things. Um, this is like 140 when I bought it. I think it's down to 130 now because they then came out with one that's really a sophisticated reel, really nice. This is the Lose Custom Inshore. Uh, this is a really nice reel, um, but this is 199. So it started going up the chain. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, it makes sense. I'll go up and I'll get myself a $250 one. But I had an issue with that one that surprised me that I would have. I had to end up usually it's very easy to tear down a bait caster. That's one of the nice things about it is you can tear it down, you can uh, clean it, you can move it and put it back together in ten minutes. You know, and all you need is a bottle of cleanse oil or whatever equivalent, and you're done. And uh, so what I ended up doing was kind of like questioning moving up the chain and said, okay, I want to move down the chain a little bit, and see what there is, right? And I ended up this um, Quantum Acuras S3. This uh, this is a fantastic reel. This is, uh, like all of these, I mean, you're looking at, this is a $99 reel. And it is, um, it's, it's actually a fantastic reel. Um, this is the one you'll see John Skinner using on his fluke trips. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is it has a quirky feature called the flipping switch, right? 
So instead of just a casting reel and you push the button and cast, now when you push the button and hold it, it's free. So if you're trying to hold bottom with a jig, it's really easy to pay out another 12 inches of line if the bottom contour changes, right? So, and I actually exchanged a message with him. And, you know, he doesn't know me from Adam, but I changed, exchanged a message with him about it when I was considering it. And I'm like, okay, so this, this is real cast. He goes, he goes, I don't know. I don't cast it, right? So he uses it in this purpose-driven system. But I did some additional research and found out that there's no reason why this reel wouldn't cast fantastically. And it does actually. It's a very good casting reel. You've got uh, control over it, uh, the, the casting brake, um, and it's ninety nine dollars. Now, if I had a choice between a five hundred dollar rod and reel, I would rather have five one hundred dollar rods and reels because the reel is not going to make as big a difference as having one on a medium heavy rod, one on a medium rod, one with a ten pound leader, one with a thirty pound leader, right? And and that's your six rods, right? So if I'm going to have six rods and I and I you know, it's like I, I live a little axiomatically, and one of my axioms in my life is never let good become the enemy or great become the enemy of good enough, right? A lot of these reels are really good enough, and they're good enough to fish for years. I mean, this one's coming up on four years old. Uh, this one I bought in July, so I've had some good times on this one so far, and it's a very effective reel. This one's probably two years old to, to lose. So there's a lot of great reels out there, a lot of great brands. Uh, clearly, Shimano and Daiwa own the market from 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 the from the perspective, and, and Luz has some fantastic reels that go all the way up to two hundred fifty dollars and have some amazing characteristics as well. Uh, but for getting started, I do recommend not going down to like some kind of a total budget reel that's going to drive you insane because it lacks certain characteristics. Um, but I do think that there are some excellent brands out there that are pushing reels out at the $99 level. And, and then you couple that with understanding why this reel is different, uh, which that's a very important thing to understand. Like this is not just a seven ounce spinning reel for $99, which you'll probably have trouble finding a seven ounce spinning reel for $99. Whereas you can get a seven ounce bait caster for $99. Um, you, you definitely need to figure out, you know, why you're doing this. What is different about this reel? And then you can take advantage of the characteristics of that reel and get those distance casts, get the consistency, get the short game going, all of that, you know. And you could even, you know, I mean, you talk about, he mentioned overruns, right? Everybody, you know, you see that picture of the guy on the boat where he's got lines flowing out of a reel. And it's like, oh, so your buddy tells you he knows how he's a bait caster, right? And he could knit a sock with all the stuff he's got hanging out of that reel. Well, the bottom line is he, you know, you got the bird's nest and you want to avoid those by managing your, your, your um, uh, backlashes. And you want to manage backlashes by managing your overruns. Well, you, once you understand what the overrun is doing, you can skip cast with these things and just understand how to stop the overrun from becoming a a backlash and how to stop the backlash from becoming a bird's nest. And once you get all that down, you could do that with a $99 reel and it's super effective. Luke, what did you go with? What are you using right now? What was that baitcaster? I have a uh, Quantum, let's see, it's a Quantum Smoke S3. And nice. uh, I've That's been happy with it. And uh, yeah. I went, I've been on both spectrums. You know, we talked earlier about it's kind of like uh, uh, you're one way or the other. Yeah, cause what, what's funny, real quick, I just, you might not even remember this because you've been writing this book for two years. So you guys listening, well, the book's probably coming out any day now uh, from when this goes live. It's called Redfish Secrets. Luke actually wrote a book, uh, like, you know, a legit 200 page book on on all the redfish secrets he's learned over the years. And you actually are bashing uh, baitcasters, which is pretty funny. I don't know if you recall that. So I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> I still do. I still do. I'll bash them both. Um, because, but because there's, they both have their pros and cons. And right. so I went from total bait casting when I was about, I was about total bass addict. That's all I cared about is bass fishing. I literally looked down upon people using spinning gear thinking they just couldn't cast a bait cast, bait yeah. caster. And, uh, and then one day I was fishing with Chip Tharp uh, in saltwater as a buddy from college. And I went out there with his dad and I had my bait caster and I saw they had spinning gear. So I was kind of, I was like, I'm, I'm going I'm to catch <laughs> fishing them. And they wrecked me. They totally owned me because we were using a little white bait uh, with no weights, free lining. Yeah. And that's what the fish were hitting. And I couldn't cast, I couldn't cast it 20 feet. And I looked yeah. like a total chump in front of these guys. <laughs> I, and I, just, I just met his dad and looked like a total chump. And I got literally, rem I remember I was so mad. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And they were using these little small spinning reels with 10 pound braid. And I, I, they were catching more and bigger fish than me. And it drove me crazy. So then I was like, okay, I, 
I wasn't like that again. So I was like, I have to get one. So I got one. I put it up with some some ten pound braid, and I was amazed at how good it did. And uh, I oh, use yeah. it for both bass fishing and for saltwater. Um, so and then I went to the to complete opposite where I only use spinning. And I bash totally bashed bait casting <laughs> because spinning is just, they're, it's very versatile. Um, you can cast further with light line with light braid. I um, in a long rod you can sling these lures. Even even the heavy ones, like I even use it for top. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can sling it. Into, there's no backlash, and you can skip better without backlashes. However, I've more recently started using bait cast again, and what I've when I'm the the situation where I think bait cast is an easy decision to do it, and spinning is not, is when fishing docks. I've been fishing docks a lot lately, testing out these shrimp lures. I've been these big fish have been crushing them, and I've been getting owned with spinning tackle with ten pound braid, and when you put heavier braid on spinning tackle your casting performance plummets yeah and when you put heavier braid on bait caster no change at all if not it might even get better so i put a 10 pound braid on bait caster and i hated it i, I now use i did 20 and i'm now using 30 i really can't tell a difference so i'm gonna you, got, go you got 30 on there now i have 30 on it now and i'm i'm losing way less fish than i ever did before and fishing docks i can now cast heavier jigs and i can have more power to pull the fish out more abrasion resistance when they get wrapped around a piling and the retrieve speed is quicker so that I'm fishing a piling. All the strikes happen within five feet of the piling. And so as soon as I'm out, the retrieve fees is faster so I can reel the lure in faster and get another cast out quicker. So yeah. it's a, in my opinion, it's an easy decision to do bait casting, but if I'm on the open flats where structure is not a problem, even if I hook into a, a, a big red, a big bull red or big snook, they're not going to get me wrapped around. I can use 10 pound braid and I can sling it effortlessly then, then then spinning is an easy decision in that case and then like everything in between is kind of like an either or um, uh, in my opinion yeah i but, think uh, they but, get us back to that golf bag approach <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so and so the, you know they have the two spectrums but um but and and you can do spinning tack with heavier line if you really want to it's just going to be tougher and you can do bait cast with really light lures in open water if you want to but it's just going to be tougher um, so there's no right or wrong. It's really just a preference thing. And even, even on the, um, uh, Mark, you were mentioning about getting tired after a while. I think that's more about muscle memory because I find myself getting worn out faster when I'm using the bait cast because I'm just, I've been, you know, 30 plus years or whatever of all spinning tackles. So it's a lot of, it's just what you're used to. And I, I love your thought, Bill, where you're talking about, um, casting all day, switching from one to the other. That's totally true. Cause they're totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Totally different muscle memories. Yeah. So that's, that's what I've been doing too. But, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm no longer totally bashing bait cast. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, you're bashing both. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm bashing both and it's all situational. And, and I think that's just with everything, even with lures, right. That there's, it's very rare that like one lure or one rod or one reel is always going to be the answer. It's really about the situation. And then, and the, the key is to match it to the right situation. Yeah. Mark, Mark, what are your thoughts? Because I know you you worked in a, a very busy tackle retail store for a long time. You got to see what was being purchased. You got to see what was getting returned with issues. What are your thoughts on on brands? Um, I, I would say that there are five major players in the bait casting industry when it comes to crossover reels. Um, as Bill mentioned, Daiwa Shimano. Um, but I would say Quantum, Luz, and 13 Fishing are probably the remaining three that have a pretty large uh, segment into that industry. Um, you know, I, I, I can take the bias out of things because I understand from the manufacturing level what goes into a quote unquote inshore bait casting product. And most people don't realize this, and I don't know that it, even Bill um, being on the quantum side, you know, on the semi-professional level of bass fishing, I, of course, was told and helped understand what makes a saltwater bait caster. And what most people don't realize that saltwater bait casters and inshore bait casters, um, the only thing that makes them that is the paint protection on the external part of the reel. Yeah. Um, so when someone says, I'm using an inshore bait caster, it really has to do with the corrosion protection on the outside of the reel. Um, you know, on internal components, you know, matter of fact, Bill, the one that he, that he held up on the quantum accurate, um, I, I know the people that designed that reel. I mean, I know them personally. 
And that particular reel, you know, was was Quantum's answer to the hundred dollar market on the freshwater side. Well, how do I make this a crossover reel? Let me, you know, make a couple of tweaks and give it a salt guard 2.0 protection. And now I have the corrosion protection. But internally on his quantum reel, it has the same PT gears, it has the same PT bearing, it has all the same internal components. So really, I, I want people to understand the differences between the two are an external corrosion paint, okay, right. which, which is huge. You know, one thing about your reel, Joe, that you held up being the, the coastal on the Daiwa, a unique thing about Daiwa is the more that you see them getting into the saltwater side of not only bait casting, but also their spinning, they change to a CRBB bearing, which is the corrosion resistant ball bearing, you know, the bearings inside the reels. So that is kind of their answer to, I'm going to give you a longer lasting ball bearing internally um, that will last 10 to 12 times longer than your standard ball bearing would be in a freshwater environment. So they have shielded protections on their bearing, but even Daiwa, who's known on the spinning market to be a mag sealed component on the spinning, they don't have mag sealed components for bait casting. So that's kind of a, a little bit of lag. And I know that kind of contradicts what I said a little earlier that bait casting market has always been the, the, the achieve market standard. But that's kind of now where they're below the standard on the spinning market on Daiwa's point of view is they have all of that engineering into the spinning now with the mag seal components. So until you do one of two things in the bait casting market to truly make it a saltwater reel is a, you're going to have to educate the customer base to say, you're going to either have to deal with noise to where I can give you a ceramic bearing system yeah. because ceramic bearings are louder so it's either you understand that, yes, it's louder than what you're used to, but now you truly have a saltwater setup or B, have to find a way to engineer mag seal components because bait casting reels on the engineering side allow more water to infiltrate the inner parts of a reel because they have whiffled spools, because they have worm gears that are external and, and exposed, because they have, in Bill's case, a flipping switch, which will allow water to get in yeah, through. That's another intrusion point. You know, so until they make the standard say, I'm either going to go ceramic or I'm going to find a way to seal something, that is a disadvantage, in my opinion, to the spinning market on the engineering side. To answer your question quickly, you know, what did I see most come back? Again, it was more so based on we sold things 90% of the time in, in one or two classifications. So, of course, we saw more of two things come back because we sold mostly those two items coming back. So the Daiwa, you know, coastal stuff and the quantum coastal stuff. Um, being an you know an accurate inshore or even the smoke that I use and that Luke is using, you know those reels came back for repair the most because they were ninety percent of our sales. So I, I can understand that. So you know there's a lot of engineering differences that consumers really don't understand too well on the bait casting market on saltwater preference. Yeah. Okay. Talk about cleaning them then. How, how do you clean yours, Bill? Uh, and I'm hearing what you're saying. Uh, are you taking it apart ever so often and really getting in there? And yeah, yeah, actually I am. Uh, and I'm taking these apart. I actually I do. I don't take my spinning reels apart, right? The spinning reels, I'll put some oil inside of the bearings that are going into the cavity, but that's about it. I'll take the, the top off and check the drag and all that kind of such. These are remarkably easy to take apart, right? Whether you've got a little flip here and you spin it and the whole thing comes apart. You have access to every one of your bearings, right? So there's a bearing there. There's a bearing here. There's a bearing behind the spool break. Uh, these are super easy to clean. There is a, uh, lose refers, I'll use their terminology, a zero reverse bearing, 
right? That that's in here that stops you from going backwards. And it's it's a roller bearing kind of a thing. And they come out really easy. These are remark. Now, this one I must say is a little bit more challenging than the most because of the flipping switch. You can tell there's a spring action. So there's a spring in here. You don't want to pop that off and go boing, and then you're running around with a magnet trying to find it, right? So you do have to be cautious. Uh, but these are remarkably. I, I mean, I looked at the one of my spinning reels. I looked at the schematic, the exploding diagram schematic, and I'm like. Yeah, that's going back for real service. There's no way I'm taking yeah. that apart, right? And there's a lot of, there's thousands of components in here, but it's actually super, super easy to maintain these. I do it on like a two month interval. Okay. Now, obviously, if I have some kind of a scenario where that reel got wet that day, I, I'm not going to, you know, leave it till a month, right? What I do with these is I literally, when I get home, I lean them against my boat, I gently spray them. Um, if it's a spinning reel, I'll give it a tap on the bottom of the rod to bounce all the water down and out. If it's a bait casting reel, I'm going to give a tap underneath the reel seat, bounce all the water away. And I set it in my garage. 24 hours later, I come back, I lube the worm here and spin it. And that's about it. Now, one of the things I would say, and he's talking about technology, um, there is a bit of a bearing war, right? There's an arms race in these, and it's all about bearing. You'll see a six bearing reel, an eight bearing reel, a 10 bearing reel. Um, I, I would, before you buy a reel, you can almost, for almost every brand, you can you can click on a link and download the, the PDF of the exploded diagram. Check out where those bearings are, right? Just do yourself a favor and check out where the bearings are. Because a six bearing reel, the bearings are probably all in the reel. And that's good. But you don't need that many bearings to get that spool to fly. So the bearings are doing other things. An eight bearing reel, you'll see bearings here on the base of the paddle sometimes. A 10 bearing reel, you'll see a bearing here and a bearing here. This is a 10 bearing reel and it's gonna have a bearing here and a bearing here. Um, this reel is old as dirt. This is uh, bushing, it runs smoothly. This is not gonna get in the way if you're catching a fish, right? And, in, and if he does, you throw it away and get a new one. Um, I did, when I got this reel, this is the LFS inshore. It's got bearings here and here. I did not know they existed. I just thought I had a, a, a paddle. Uh, these seized on me. And they were corroded so badly because I never took care of them. I didn't know they existed. So uh, uh, graciously, Lou sent me a whole new assembly and uh, for free, and I uh, started over again. Now I take care of these bearings, right? So you have to take care of, find out where your bearings are for sure, right? And the moving parts and take care of them. I don't take the actual like gear assembly apart, but maybe annually, unless again, I dunk a reel if that, if that unfortunately happens. But I take these out, I will flush the bearings as best I can, usually with surplus oil, or I will flush them sometimes, like even, you know, coming from skateboarding as a kid and my kids having skateboards, I actually made a bearing cleaner system out of a little pill bottle that you can make and you can really agitate the bearings with a solvent. Uh, but most of the time, if you're on top of the game with, the, with your real maintenance, you don't have to do that. You're really just flushing them out, making sure that they're smooth. Um, but sometimes like I have a spinning reel, I got a cup, you know, this is a, this is a die with Fuego LT, right? This is my example of a real hundred dollar reel class reel. That is just a rinse and go. I've never done anything with this reel except for a little bit of jot of oil here and here. It's a rinse and go reel. It's a disposable reel. I have another reel that I send back for real service every couple of years. It's a little bit more of a hoity toity reel and they put a bearing here, initially a standard bearing and then eventually a, um, ceramic bearing this is putting a bearing in harm's way right this bearing is far more exposed to salt and elements every single day you go fishing and the same is true with the with the paddles if you have bearings in them so you got to look at the exploded diagram and it's not complex at all these are very simple to put a uh, a pick in there pull that out get to the screw take it off clean the bearings put them back lube them and put them back but in, in all honesty the dial of fuego that is a bushing a plastic bushing, a Delrin or Teflon, whatever, it never goes bad. It never makes a lick of noise. So sometimes this bearing war isn't to your advantage. So check check the exploded diagram. And if you see a 10 bearing reel, go, where are the bearings and are they, how are they helping? Right? Are they just helping this reel look better than the competitor because it's got 10 instead of eight? Yeah, that's good. I think um, one other issue for a lot of us who are uh, – kind of reliant, heavily reliant on spinning. And then all of a sudden you go, you know, to a, a brand new bait caster is you got, you got the break and you got this spool 
thing, you know, tension knob and drag, like how, how do you, where do you even start with all that for someone who's, who's new and just getting into it? And they're looking at the reel and like, Oh, what, what am I supposed to do with all this stuff? It seems foreign. Well, actually, I brought something for that. I brought something for that. This is uh, a knife, right? This is a fillet knife or a meat slicing knife, right? So this is analogous to it fits in the TV screen here, right? It's analogous to a rod. You're going to back cast. You're going to load that rod. And when you go forward, you're going to doubly load that rod. And when you pop that rod to a stop, all that energy is going somewhere, right? The unloading of the rod. You have to ask yourself, where is that energy going? Fly fishing, we're fly casting. We're not fly casting, we're casting the line. The energy is dumped into the line, right? All the lines around our ankle, we do it right, all the line goes down and the fly is just along for the ride. Spinning reels, what are, where's that energy going when that releases, right? That energy is going into the bait. The bait, the lure, the whatever is flying and the reel is just open, go and take whatever you want. You know, that's why we like... <laughs> Eight pound test line. That's very brave. That's probably like 10 pound test break. But you want something supple, small, easy to go through the guides. Cause you just literally want no resistance to that bait. And so you're literally bait casting when you're casting a spinning reel. So that's kind of, you know, don't go into Bass Pro Shop and ask for a bait casting spinning reel, but, or tell them I sent you. Um, but when you, if you look at this again and you do it in a bait caster, where is that energy going? Take a second to think about it. It's actually going two places. It's going into the bait, but then immediately it's going into the spool. Bait casting is spool casting. And, 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 and Mark alluded to it. When you, when you do that cast and you get that bait going, it, it dumps the energy into the spool. It's like a can of silly shrink. You have to keep up with it. You have to pay out that line, right? So that's where that comes from. And Another analogy is like looking at a basketball. You're at a basketball game. A guy's going to make a three-point shot, right? He's going to make the shot. It's going to leave his hand. It's going to go up to an apex, and it's going to go down to the rim. At that apex, if you hit it before then, it's a stuff, right? If you hit it after, then it's goaltending, right? So just think about that apex of a, of a default cast. We actually want to avoid that kind of cast, by the way, with a big caster. But if you look at that cast, if you are suffering backlashes or overruns in the first half of that cast, it is your casting break. Right, because you overexcited that reel. The can of silly string is on full blast. The line's heading out. The lure has to keep up with it. You have to stop that reel from being overexcited. You either are adding, in uh, this case, uh, I'll give you this is probably the most extraordinary case, so I'll, I'll take it apart and show you. But the second half of that cast, coming from the apex down to the rim of the basket, that is now the charge of your spool break. That's actually pretty easy. When you first get a reel and you put a lure on it and you just sit there at your, in your living room or on your dock or on your boat, whatever, just press the button, let the lure fall from the reel tip to the ground. And if when the lure hits the ground, if the, if the spool keeps going and you get an overrun, you need to back down and add a little bit more spool break. This is just a friction break on the spool break, right? So you, you've got these two breaks. You've got a spool break and you've got a casting break. And the casting break can be very elaborate. This one is actually a dual casting break. This is the uh, the Lose Custom Inshore. And so what you're dealing with here is you have a centrifugal style break, which will connect with this ring. That's if I'm showing you this right. And then you see the magnets in here, right? So you have an ability to adjust that how much you excite that reel, how fast the rate of silly string is coming out in the first part of that cast. So if I were starting out, I would do what I just said. I would put a lure on. I would uh, drop that lure from the rod tip. When it hits the ground, if the overrun is starting, just tweak it until the overrun stops. That's your default position for your spool, for your spool break. Now, for the casting break, I would turn it all the way on. If you're a newbie, turn it all the way on, right? What you have here is the ability to pop in and out on a centrifugal break. You can pop in and out these little breaks. And as this is spinning, centrifugal force throws them out and they hit this metal rim. So as this overspins, you apply more pressure through centrifugal force to this metal rim, all right? And you'll see that in some of the other reels as well. Or you have an electromagnetic break, which is interacting with the metal spool, and these two fields fight one another, kind of like electro brakes on a train, and they will arrest the 
the the tendency for that reel just to explode with just silly string throwing out string, you know, throwing out line and your lure not keeping up. So I would turn the mag break all the way on and start casting and back it down, back it down, back it down until your stroke. And then that's another aspect of this that you know you you want an even stroke when you're casting. You don't want to have an erratic. I mean, when I, I started out fishing with say four uh three to four spinning reels and I started out with one bait caster. That's kind of tricky because you're just slinging baits all day long and you pick up a bait caster. And if you do this wild erratic cast, A, you don't need to do it. And B, it can cause disaster, right? Because now you're going to overexcite that spool. So when you change out baits, you make some tiny adjustments. When you when you go from a casting a bait caster to pitching, right? I'm going to go over here and turn this break all the way off. I'm going to reach down here and I'm going to grab this and I'm going to spin my spool break all the way off through my spool is literally loose. So this break off, this on, it's a real quick thing you do in almost an instant. And now you can pitch and get a pitch two boat lengths away from you, you know? So, and then you go back to casting, you bring this back up to your number and you tighten that back up and you're good to go. So there's some aspects of it. Once you understand that you're really casting the spool, that's the key, right? Then all of a sudden you realize, oh, now I get what I got to do here and I get what I got to do here. And um, so you understand it from the concept of that arc cast and there being an apex and one break is handling one aspect of it and the other break is handling the other aspect of it. But as I mentioned, you also want to avoid that cast, right? Because you avoid that cast because you're actually causing when you hit that apex and start going down, gravity's working on that reel, the, uh, that, that lure, the weight's slowing down, the pace is slowing down. You're going to invite an overrun. You'll see a lot of bait casters, myself included. They're doing roll casts. We're keeping that line going as horizontal as possible. There's little arc. We don't want to do a lot of arcy casts like you would do at a spinning reel. Because again, you're casting that lure and a spinning reel, the, 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 the spool is just sitting there going, Hey, yo, take whatever line you want. And so when that lure slows down, the payout slows down. No, no problem, right? It is a, could be a bigger problem than spade casting. But once you get all that down, it's like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> you know, so that's how I look at it. That was helpful. Mark, what do you, what, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, my recommendation too is if you're new to take what Bill just said, and I just, I, I would go one click more. Um, so whenever that lure does fall to a slow method, you know, whenever you're setting your spool, um, I, I would I would go to where it doesn't move at all. OK, and the yeah. reason why is the inertia from that load and unload on the rod when you're casting, when you have a little bit too much break on your you're now training your mind to understand what the spool is doing under that heavy load and unload. So right. if you set it too tight in the beginning yeah you might only get 20 yards but now you understand what that revolution is doing on the spool and how that load and unload is going to you know hurt or help on that compensation of the mag setting so in my opinion you know as you get you know more education behind the bait casting and you are able to fish a reel like bill and myself can um I would just start heavier than normal and then work your way back. Like he was alluding to on the external adjustment of that reel. So start, start heavy on, on settings and then work your way back. You know, another thing that Bill mentioned, you know, with the external adjustments, you know, how often does, does Luke or anyone go out there and, you know, it's, it's real calm in the morning and then boom, 10 o'clock hits and now the wind's coming. Okay. Nope. And that's another beauty behind the bait casting market is those external adjustments are also wind and, you know, climate adjustments, you know, that can happen on the ready as well. So not only are they based on lure weight um, and, and solving that issue, but it's also the, the, the climate change as, as well with, with the wind and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, and I see we're uh, getting low on time. It's going to happen to everybody who uses one talking about a backlash bird's nest, whatever you want to call it. What any tips to getting those things out? Obviously there's, we've talked about some tips to kind of avoid them. Do you guys have any tips to get them out quickly? There. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. To me, what it is, is, is it's you really tracing to where the problem is on the spool. 
And I think that that's where most people go wrong is they just start snatching line out, you know, just to try to get some tangles untangled. But truly, you know, if you if you really just put the pressure and, and crank the reel to where you can really search and find where that knot source is, is to is, is to attack that knot source first and cleanly. Don't just start ripping line out to try to untangle this big mess, because once you do that and then you got mess everywhere. So that's, that's one deal I've seen, you know, even Tony made a video, you know, on salt strong, you know, whenever he was doing the, how to get a bait, you know, a backlash off of a bait caster and how he really just, you know, closed the, the, the thumb bar release and really, you know, pushed it hard to, to pull that knot back out of the spool, you know, as a problem, you know, that's another method of doing so is to, is to really pull that issue away from the dig. Cause that's, that's what it is. You know, if, if you can imagine that, that slow speed, here's the first guide of your rod. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a cast in slow motion, but on a bait casting, when it's going towards the first guide, it actually has a natural bow coming off of the bait cast reel. So it's actually creating a friction point at that first guide. It's not a lineal you know, uh, approach off of your, off of your reel, there is an arc before it hits that. And what happens because of that arc, it's, 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 the spool is spinning faster than the line is coming off. So, and what's happening is it's, it's kind of binding on itself. So if you can find that initial bind, you'll be able to get it out, you know, even quicker. So it's find the knot source and understand the, the, that, that force that creates that, and you, you'll prevent a lot more. Right, and I think the last point you just made is perfect. You, you want to prevent them, right? That's the first thing to do to get out a knot is prevent them, right? So watch your overruns. Your overruns are very important. People talk about backlashes and people talk about birds and but watch your overruns because they're starting to tell you things, right? And again, you can use an overrun to your advantage for certain scenarios. What I find though, it, the, the technique that has been discussed before, and as you mentioned, uh, Tony bringing up, putting your thumb hard pressure, cranking that in, I would have to say that works 60 to 70% of the time. So always do that first in my mind. Uh, the, the, the biggest no-no in my book is don't pull hard on that, dude, because you're just going to make it worse. What happens if you kind of look at this in slow-mo, right? You've got these loops of line, which, which you see an overrun. You've got these loops of line. Or if you've ever let your line down a little too fast when you're offshore fishing with mono and all of a sudden – that you 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 get that spool racing and your and your drop stops you will you will boing you'll get those overruns and you'll get these big loops those loops are what you're dealing with right that's there's no there's there's one 300 yards of line here there's no knot nobody reached in and tied an overhand knot that it's an interaction between those loops so be less inclined to yank on that line be more inclined to yank on the loops and pick them out and as you spin those loops out you'll see where they're dug in around or twisted around it. So be careful not to turn the pro make the problem worse with the actions that you're doing and, and, and look at those loops and slowly feed that line out. I think one of the biggest things too is like if you land a fish or you have an interaction with a mangrove branch and you put some pressure on that to get back or you land a fish, don't make your next cast go right back to fishing, right? Make your next cast more of a false cast and then when you see where that cast lands, pull a little line out. Make sure that you have it dug in, right? So those are the steps you can avoid it, right? I would rather avoid a backlash and deal with one. I mean, I've had them where I've literally had to take a blowtorch to the reel and fill the line away, you know, because uh, of weird scenarios. Uh, I cast one time. I was on a dock visiting the family, and I'm on the dock up in Inverness on the, on the, on the Salapaka Lake. And I really wanted to get to these arrowhead plants on the other side of this cove. I did this wicked cast right over my head was a cypress branch. My lure went up and hit that. My lure went nowhere. My line went everywhere, right? So there's something that you're not going to, I mean, I literally had to throw that spool away, of line away and re-spool. It was just a nasty bird's nest because of the nature of it being the worst case scenario. But be, be patient with it. Don't, don't get into a, it's no different than picking out a wind knot. There, if you got a wind knot, your spinning line. There's no knot there, right? There's just line around line around line. It's not actually like somebody tied an overhand knot. So just be patient with it and, and you'll get it out. Cool. One final thing, because I, I know it's going to be a question, especially for 
a lot of our listeners who who do want to get into to some of this bait casting. How do you pair it with a rod? Any just quick tips? I know this could be a, an entire separate podcast episode because um, that was even my question. I got this nice reel, and then I, I sent CA a text. I was like, all right, what rod should I get with it? Uh, any, <laughs> any quick uh, any quick tips? Uh, for me, uh, my quick tips, uh, uh, you know, look for rods that are going to match the conditions that you're after. I mean, I've all over the place now. I've kind of changed. I was a kayak fisherman initially sitting on my butt in a kayak, and so I loved a seven-and-a-half-foot rod, and I love mediums, and I love medium um, fast. And I would have one medium heavy in case I want to tangle with a bigger fish like a Kobe or if I get around something like that. Uh, I'm now staying on the bow of a boat and I'm largely working my fishing rod down. So I've actually backed down like this is a, this is a Falcon Coastal Clearwater. I have one of these in a 6.6. It's actually one of my favorite rods. Um, again, I would point out for bait casting, pay real close attention to the lure weight. The lure weight actually is, I think, more important in a bait caster because it's it's more going to affect the effectiveness of your cast and not just shave six inches off or, or 10 inches off or 10 feet off of a spinning cast, which you might not even feel, right? You'll feel the difference if you're underperforming. You'll feel the difference in your casting more here than you, you'll you just get a cast and it's like, oh, well, that's good. I caught a fish even on that cast. And you don't realize your casting is underperforming because you don't get problems of it. Uh, so I, I have mediums, medium heavy, uh, fast. I like fast is perfect. Again, I went down to fast. I had the, you know, Salt Strong had done the review of the TFO professional series long ago. I bought a few of those. I fell in love with that rod. And I ended up when I bought this first bait caster, I went with the TFO professional in um in the bait caster. And I liked that a lot. I, I had actually, I think I did medium heavy on that because I wanted something that was going to be a little bit more forceful than setting the hook with top waters and other things like that. Um and I have some here, like this is one that I picked up actually before going down to 10,000 Islands. This is actually, you know, Hero Rod. I actually picked this up for $20 because it was actually going to be a spare rod because we're out in the middle of the boonies. You break a rod, you just lost a, 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 a combo. So this is actually a spare rod, but it's really, really noodly. It's, it's, it's a medium action, but it's really like, like again, if you, if you take the knife example, right? This is a knife that's tapered. How many knives do you have down below? <laughs> I brought well, I brought two for this reason, right? Because there's <laughs> if you look at this, this is thicker going down to a taper. So I can't show you this eight-foot rod, right? But I can show you that look at the bend, it's in that top third. And look at how fast when you release that energy, that energy is released immediately, right? That's the fast part. If you look at this knife that I just dropped on the floor, this is one that is super thin all the way. This is like a parabolic rod. This is like a mod fast rod. This is what you would want to chase down tarpon and other large fish where you have to have an extended fight. Look at where that bend is. It's way down by the hill. So this is more parabolic. And this is almost cartoonish. It's like boing, 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 boing. You know, it's, it's really kind of like a noodle rod. There are reasons to have that. This actually was the rod I just, this this September, caught my keeper snook on. It was so fun fighting the rod, fighting that 20, um, it was 28 and a half inch snook, 32, 32 and a half inch snook on this thing. And it was just fantastic because you've got this noodly rod and this fish is taking long, long runs. And I got the addition to my drag. I've got this rod on my side. So there's a lot of reasons. It's so hard. I would start out with a medium fast, especially if you want to go light. I would start out with a medium if you want to start chucking artificial, uh, like a top dog or a spook. Those are those are those are very good. Um, it's just like anything else. You kind of kind of play with it a little bit to see. But uh, I run medium uh, fast on almost everything, and then I got a couple of medium heavies, and then I got a couple of these noodle rods. Mark, any uh, any additional thoughts? Yeah, mine is more based on the weight class of the lure. You know, I would say that anything under a quarter ounce, I'm traditionally a medium guy. Um, if I'm if I'm using bigger baits, you know, like a like a uh, slam shady bomber, for instance, with a little bit heavier jig head, and I want to cover water, I'm a medium heavy guy, fast tip, uh, just because I, I want that added strength on a hard hook set at a distance cast. Um, so to me, it's a, it's a weight class on lure. Uh, I find myself fishing more medium heavies, um, just because I use a little bit heavier bait per se. I'm not throwing a Miradine 17 MR, 
you know, with a medium heavy, it's just not the right rod for that. Right. Uh, once I get to a little bit larger jig head, a little bit larger platform bait, you know, four and a half inch bait or larger, I'm a medium heavy guy. And I just, that's my confidence. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Well, guys, this has been awesome. This has been uh, fun. I see we're uh, like at an hour here. So um, I'd love any all feedback, just like last time. This is why we did this one. If you guys have any questions at all, we're going to have this entire video and all the show notes and links to everything we talked about at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. Leave us a comment. We would love to answer it. We would love to know any other thoughts that you had, things that we missed. Uh, other other specific questions that you have on bait casting reels, casting reels, anything that uh, or uh, spinning reels, anything you can possibly imagine, we want to hear. That's how we uh, we come up with these new podcast ideas. So, and Bill, Bill Dewey, dude, thank you so much, man. This is awesome. You were uh, I got nothing that rhymes with my last name. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same problem, Bill. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fun. So, if you guys want to. Hear more from Bill. Go to the Salt Strong Insider Club. He's in there in the community. He's on the Facebook group quite a bit. Always super helpful. Tons of knowledge on everything you can imagine, including, you know, fixing up and tricking your skiff. I see you commenting in there quite a bit as well <laughs> in that Facebook group. Always a, a wealth of knowledge. And uh, you will see Luke and I using uh, bait casters a little bit more, but right. not, too, not too much more. I'll be with I'm, I'm digging it uh, again for dock fishing. It's a game changer. And, and I wish I would have heard this before because, um, back in the old days when I did bait caster, we only had the one knob, the one break. Yeah. And so I had it super loose and I wasn't casting far at all. And I was just like, these, this reel is terrible. And then all of a sudden I was like, Oh man, there's another knob over here. And so I started doing that. And then I, the I was double like, break. Yeah. yeah. The, the double break. So make sure you know about the casting break <laughs> and the spool break. Because uh, not like the old days, these are uh, much more complex. But when yeah, used yeah. properly, they're they're uh, they're pretty awesome. This little bitty reel has some crazy good drag. It's super light, and uh, and it can cast. This little bitty spool can hold a twenty thirty pound line to pull some big fish out of dock. So I'm I've been very happy with it. Yep, and it's funny. We you know we went and fished with Marcos and his wife Luana down in uh, in Everglades City, Chukaluski. And that's all they used. And, and they're going after a big snook, like, you know, 40 plus inch snook. And all they're using, and they're fishing, you know, heavy structures, some docks, some pilings. And even we went out kind of offshore and fished some of these wrecks where they knew where a bunch of big schools of snook were. And I mean, they're just cranking down on these big snook and owning them in seconds. And I was just like, whoa. Uh, I mean, they, they, Luana was out fishing all of us. She's just sitting there on the back, like <laughs> plucking these big snook off. I was like, man. They totally uh, owned us. That, that was, it was similar to getting owned with uh, with Chip. I mentioned before, it totally owned us, and that's coincidentally, right? I got out and started using my bait caster more yeah. because when you see it, like when you actually see the results, it, it's you can't. I mean, you, you can uh, you can't get over it. You have to. You just have to go ahead and, and, and switch. And and it's. I mean, uh, for that heavy structure, I'm I'm a, I'm a huge bait cast fan. For the inchworth stuff, I'm still a huge spinning fan. Yep. So guys, I, I do pumpkin, right? I, I switch yep. off and on. <laughs> yeah, this is super helpful. This is fun, guys. So if you have any questions, let us know. We talked about Luke's Redfish Secrets book coming soon. We do have the Brazilian shrimp coming soon. Uh, that will be an awesome bait to test out with your either old school or new school bait casting reel. So guys, we appreciate you. We love you. We appreciate everything and all the support and we love questions. So please do whether you're watching this on the YouTube or listening on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, leave us a question. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, subscribe and leave us a review as well. It helps out big time. Otherwise we are out. Bill, Mark, Luke. Thank you guys. Peace. Cause fishing, it's in my